Good afternoon. I'm Walter Schwabe, and welcome to another episode of Gov2. I'm your host, and very happy to be back in studio, although last week uh, we had a lot of fun. I was down in Kananaskis, Alberta, which is on the southern end of this province. It's a beautiful uh, part of the uh, province uh, near the Rocky Mountains. And I was down there speaking with the uh, Society of Local Government Managers. They have a, an annual mountain refresher retreat, they call it. And this is a, basically a room, if you can imagine, with uh, nearly 100 people that are all in the, uh, let's call it the, the bureaucratic process, the administrative process of uh, all sorts of sizes of towns, villages, and cities. Uh, they're in the, the room there last week to learn more about how their town, their city might be able to leverage not only social technologies, but but I exposed them to the open government movement. And for the most, uh, most of the people in the room, this was the first time not only did they hear the term open government, but uh, the first time that they had even come across any of the concepts. So we broke a lot of new ground last Thursday, and I was able to in the afternoon. During the regular slot, we had Michael Crichton anchoring the show in my stead, who did a great job. We, uh, we certainly uh, had the show go forward, but I uh, uh, was able to Skype in remotely for about 10 minutes at the top of the show. So that was kind of cool to give the afternoon session some ex uh, opportunities to, to watch us put a show together and, and for us to do something live on location. So uh, very cool to, to pull that off. Today I want to talk uh, a little bit about, uh, get you up to uh, date on, on a few current events that have happened in the last week. One of the things that I want to direct you to is FusedLogic.com. That's our, our primary blog for the, uh, the digital agency. I put up a post today uh, with my version of a, of a pledge that I found off of GovFresh. And later in the show here, I'm going to introduce you to Luke Fretwell, the founder of GovFresh. But I was looking through the site today, and I saw this interesting pledge that uh, was going around. And I'm going to ask Luke about this. But the pledge is about the, the mayoral candidates signing it. And, and in terms of their commitment to open government for the city of San Francisco, what I did was I made some adjustments to the, the content itself um, and, uh, you know, focused it for Alberta because we're going through a series of, you know, leadership races here in Alberta with the various parties. And I thought, you know, it would be interesting to see which candidates out there in which political parties view this as, a, as an important step for them. It says a lot about a person's character. It says a lot about a party's character. And so if you stand for open government as a set of principles, just philosophically, then I think that you are headed in the right direction. And so I wanted to put that pledge up there just to see, just out of curiosity, if we've got anybody that is buying into this program. And I think that those who do decide to make an issue out of signing this pledge and actually embrace it, I think is going to say a lot of things to Albertans that, in fact, personally, I want to hear. Um, I know a lot of El other Albertans are in favor of open government and a more transparent, more collaborative government here in the province of Alberta. So that's why I put the pledge up there. Let everybody know about it. If you've got a favorite political party or politician or elected official, whatever you want to call them, uh, that you think should know about this pledge, uh, just go ahead and take it right off the website. Uh, uh, you know, and of course, I reference uh, um, uh, GovFresh as the, the original source for that and, and the link to the City of San Francisco version. So uh, that's what I wanted to start off with, let you know about that. Also, um, Alan Silverberg, and he, Alan is not the only one to, to talk about this particular uh, item, news item, uh, out of Brazil. But Brazil's made some news recently about them really, truly, you know, diving into the Gov2 uh, movement, if you will. The, uh, that uh, is something that they've said that they're going to move forward on. And Alan Silverberg has put out a post at uh, SilverbergInnovations.com um, where he goes and, and, and gives an overview of this, this entire uh, situation. Now, he, he references the website Brazil, spelt with an S. Uh, brazilgov2.com.br 
is in the post. Um, and a really beautiful picture. Uh, <laughs> it's a very cool picture. Man, there's some great architecture down in Brazil. Would love to have an opportunity to see Sao Paulo at, at night uh, like this picture per, uh, uh, demonstrates. But uh, there's some great resources here. And again, Alan's isn't the only post uh, that covers this, this news. But uh, it's interesting because we do have viewers from Brazil. Our analytics tell us that. And in addition, we've actually had folks from a local city down there, Fortaleza, is, uh, I believe is how you pronounce the name, of the city down in Brazil. Um, they're interested in coming on the show. We're going to have uh, we're going to have some folks from that city on our show. They've been watching the show, paying attention to it. They love it. In fact, they're working on uh, basically uh, translating the show into Portuguese so that they can show all of the, the the content to the administration at this city in Brazil, which I find absolutely cool. So I, I don't know what uh, my my uh, my Skype guests think about about being uh, having their words converted into Portuguese and what they might sound like, but I think it's a very cool thing nonetheless. And it shows that we are continuing to grow our global audience here at Gov2 on FuseLogic TV. So um, love that, that uh, Brazil is taking a more overt movement. You know, we've seen this kind of thing. Uh, it's no big news or new news that the uh, United Kingdom has moved uh, headlong into this direction. So has Australia. Uh, Australia is a hotbed for open government and, and Gov2 initiatives and discussion. Um, Senator Kate Lundy down in Australia, absolutely a major proponent for this. Our own very, uh, very own Chris Moore, CIO for the city of Edmonton here in our local region, has uh, met with uh, Senator Kate Lundy uh, in person, went down to Australia, had some great discussions there. There's some new, uh, you know, relationships being formed and discussions being formed globally as a result. It's very fascinating how all of this is unfolding. I wanted to move now quickly to ohmygov.com. Uh, and Alex Salta put up a post uh, this morning relating to, and what he's doing is extracting his top 10 things that he extracted out of the recent announcement uh, and release of New York City's uh, digital roadmap, which I found fascinating. Um, this is his take on pulling, uh, you know, his top 10 things out of that. And I, I, find it, uh, I find it interesting. I haven't had a chance to go through this forensically, if you will, but I think he brings up uh, some key points. And I wanted to talk with uh, uh, Luke and uh, Alexander here shortly about 311 in San Francisco, certainly with Open 311 out of the city of San Francisco and the APIs uh, there and, and so on, and, and the, the success or maybe lack of success with that initiative. But it seems like, uh, you know, and Alex uh, Salta uh, uh, points this out, that the 3-in-1 is very successful, in his opinion, in New York City. Um, I think it's probably quite successful in many cities across the country. Not nearly enough, though. Um, I think that it's, it's something that's incredibly important to city services and for citizens and residents to leverage. There's some, there's some great uh, examples here. And I, I found it, you know, I actually found it kind of a non-techie piece, which is what, what appealed to me about it. Uh, not because I, I sort of can't keep up on that, but it just it seems like it's real kind of layman terms for the most part in how he's written it. And I, I see a lot of value in that. And he, he throws some good stats out there in terms of how the New York City as a, a digital footprint is doing. Um, it's surprising to me. I thought actually some of the numbers were a lot lower than I would have expected with a city of that size, the size of New York. Uh, but that being said, the numbers are no slouch. If we look at 832,000 views of uh, the NYPD's YouTube channel, <laughs> i got to check that out. Head to NYPD's YouTube channel, see what they've got up there. But uh, almost a million views of that channel, which is very cool, obviously. Um, so there's lots of great information on, on this particular website that I can find. I like it. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, probably a website that I'm going to frequent more. I've only been here a couple of times, this being the second one, and, and I picked up on the NYC piece. That's why I went there today. Okay, let's move on and introduce um, our next uh, Skype guest here on Gov2. Um, we're now joined via Skype by uh, Luke Fretwell, who is the founder uh, of GovFresh.com and, and all of the associated blogs and spinoffs from that particular brand, uh, Luke uh, Founded GovFresh in May 2009, and he joins us from uh, Lafayette, California, just uh, east of San Francisco. He's, he tells me roughly about 30 minutes by the BART train, uh, east of Oakland, rather. Um, and uh, so, Luke, welcome to the show. Welcome to Gov2. 
Well, thanks for having me, Walter. It's great to be on with uh, you and Alex, uh, the who I like to call the hardest working man in Gup Duo business. <laughs> I would have to agree that I think that, uh, you know, I used to think that Adriel Hampton was uh, was cloned in a robot. And I think that actually there's no doubt to me that Digifile has taken over that role. It just seems like Alexander is everywhere. But, Luke, let's talk. We'll get to Alexander in a minute. uh, But, um, Luke, let's talk about GovFresh. Tell me, what was the the motivation for you starting GovFresh.com back in 2009? Um, well, it was really, you know, it started off as just kind of seeing what was happening around um, social media and government, especially at the federal level. And, um, you know, as someone who grew up in the Washington, D.C. area and studied political science, I've always been fascinated with what's going on with government and politics. Um, moved, I moved to San Francisco in 2000 and really have since then been focused mostly on development, web development, user interface, and stuff like that. Um, And I guess about two or three years ago when I noticed that the government was getting online um, and getting more engaged with social media, I thought, well, I could just aggregate these feeds and create my own news channel. And um, that was the original inception of GovFresh, was basically aggregated feeds of um, what was going on at the federal level. So you could click on a White House link and see everything going on from the White House related to Flickr, Twitter, YouTube, and even its blog. So it was basically how I started getting my news. And, um, you know, after watching what was going on and seeing a lot of what was happening in government and looking at the websites, um, it just kind of dawned on me that a lot of them were literally federal disasters. Um, And uh, um, so, uh, you know, I started to blog about it. um, And, um, you know, those were the old days of open government. And, um, you know, it was kind of one of the first people to start talking about it. And um, it just kind of progressed from there, you know, and fundamentally, um, you know, the principles of open government are something that um, that I believe in. And I think that any, any citizen and elected official can, you know, as you were mentioning before, I think that um, it's not something to run away from. It's something to be proud of. And it's something that I just feel passionate about. Right on. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the business model behind GovFresh. Is it, uh, how, how do you make a living every day? Everybody wants to talk about the business model. Um, well, currently I um, lead uh, editorial and um, media operations for a company based in D.C. focused on um, federal IT. Um, so, and, and that company is called FedScoop, um, and it's an events um, and uh, media company, like I said, around federal government IT. Um, so that's what I spend my days doing. And um, for, for, for now, you know, mostly GovFresh has been um, really my personal civics project and labor of love. Right. Right. Do you think that uh, have you reached a point of critical mass with respect to your content reach and the contributors that you have at GovFresh? Because I know that Alexander Howard, our other guest here today, uh, is also a contributor, as many others are. Do you think have you seen a situation where maybe GovFresh.com has influenced discussion at any level of government across the U.S. where you might have broken a story or you might have had an opinion on the site that now has influenced or changed the shift of the discussion pattern? Um, I I don't know if I can answer that. Um, You know, I mean, I'd like to think that people are reading it and getting something out of it. Um, uh, I don't know. That's a tough question. Um, I would hope so. Fair enough. I mean, I know it's sometimes, you you know, it's, it, it might be tough if there isn't a bread, breadcrumb trail to, to, to nail it down specifically. But yeah. I just was out of curi- curiosity wondering because, you know, um, as we continue to do shows like this, for example, and we put out great content, we take opinions, uh, maybe we form our own opinions, but we, we voice opinions, maybe share others' opinions through the shows right. and through sites like GovFresh.com. Uh, I have to think that it does sink into the psyche of certain certain groups of people, and maybe it does influence, hopefully, to some degree, uh, you know, discussion. And maybe this show inspires, uh, you know, people to take on the the discussion in their own hometown or 
or a local area and, and maybe become a champion for it in some way. So, yeah, I let's, think that, uh, so, you know, on that, on that point, you know, I think that, um, you know, Alex is influential and Alex has been blogging, um, for, I don't know how long, um, now, but, um, you know, a lot of people read Alex and are, um, I think that he is fairly influential in this space. Um, so, um, by those standards, I think that, um, uh, people reading Alex via GovFresh, um, it is having an influence. Um, you know, I think as far as the the traffic and the volume, you know, it's all related to how much is, is put into it. So, you know, the more time I spend in, the more traction you see. Um, but it's also, you know, I, I think that um, for me personally, it it's a um, mechanism for me to just learn. And mm -hmm. fundamentally, that's what helps keep me going with it. It's just I'm always interested in learning and helping facilitate things. And if I can do that just a little bit, um, you know, I'm, I'm satisfied and I'm happy with with the work that that's being done around GovFresh. Um, you know, maybe at some point it'll reach critical mass, but you know, small steps are good. Absolutely, I agree with you 100. percent In fact, you know what? That last comment about having a chance to learn—that's exactly what this show is about for me personally, and in a lot of ways, uh, surrounding myself with people in the in this space that are doing different things. Uh, certainly every show I get to learn something new from somebody, whether it's Alex or it's uh, someone like yourself, Luke, or anybody who's on the show. There's always something I hope to take away from it myself personally. So it's it's a great point. I'd like to move on. You you created some interesting video content here uh, in the last week, uh, last week I believe actually, in fact, where you uh, attended uh, SF Open 2011, I believe, wasn't it? And where you were interviewing San Francisco mayoral candidates and you put a little a little video piece together for us here at FuseLogic TV. You've, you've put that up on GovFresh.com as well. Uh, I'm going to have Evan run that video, and then we're going to come back and talk about one, some of those things. And I'm going to have Alex weigh in as well on this. But some of the things that the candidates say, I, you can definitely tell. Watch for which candidates maybe know a little bit more about this subject than others. Go ahead, Evan. Let's run that clip. Open government, to me, is about government wide open so that anybody and everybody can, in fact, know what's going on, uh, not only in terms of getting information, but more importantly, you know, how decisions are made. It's about creating a new space and, frankly, a new relationship between government and our San Franciscans. Uh, it's part about transparency, about making sure that government is truly open and that everyone knows what it is that city government's doing. Open government is an administration that is conducting its day-to-day -day activities, uh, its day-to-day -day business in an open, honest, transparent manner. It really means three things. Uh, transparency, participation, and collaboration. Open government is the opportunity to take all the available data and information that exists in the city, that exists within government, and put it in a simple, transparent way or platform so that people in the community can access that information and use it to improve everyone's lives. For me, open government is giving government the best chance to be successful. It's extremely important that we make available uh, data about uh, what's going on in our city, uh, what's uh, information that we may have uh, within our city. That, that's absolutely critical because all of us uh, need to know what's going on. I think we need to increase the number of data sets that we have out in the public. Two in particular I'm very interested in. One is um, letting the public know anytime the government puts out a check pay someone, pays a vendor, we should put all that information online so that the public knows exactly what we are spending our money on. And the number one element in my platform is the eradication of systemic corruption. I would use every possible tool to accomplish that goal. Technology is very important. It provides data, 
It can the data collection, data. What is it? Uh, analytics, data analytics. That is so important. Is it real? Is it genuine? And then, can the public access that in a way that helps us promote good service? The most important thing that we can do to uh, is both symbolic and real, and that is to create a new media office in the office of the mayor. And I'd love to see all the stuff that we do with Data SF, and uh, I think uh, having I participated in things like Transportation Cat Camp and Apps for Good, and and having more of those collective forums where we're putting things out in the community and having uh, all the resource in the community create more simplistic apps so that data is actually meaningful and, and actually gets to people. I'm relaunching my website in the next couple of weeks as I as things really pick up in June and people start to focus, and I'm going to have a section where I'm going to ask people to give me their ideas. I think that that would be a great thing for a mayor to do, would be to have an open door where people can continually suggest the things that would enable them to have trust in government. Pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I found, what I loved about that is uh, the candidate uh, Joanna Rees, uh, you know, she had mentioned that she had actually attended some of the camps and she had uh, a transparency camp and so on. And, and I, uh, that was the only candidate that I picked up on that had said that they had actually attended the camps. And you can gain so much knowledge and insight from actually attending these events. Um, you know, so I think that she has a bit of an edge there. But there were some great comments made by these candidates yeah. in terms of... Uh, uh, suggestions on the new websites being uh, being open, um, you know. So, what did you guys think, Alex? I'm going to go to you first, uh, even though Luke, this is Luke's piece. But Alex, I'm going to get you in. What were some of your thoughts? What did you pick up on that? Well, uh, first, it's great to be back here again. So, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I think just to going back to what you're, you're talking about before in terms of the impact of Gov Fresh, that video is the epitome of that. Here, you've got the candidates uh, in San Francisco for the next mayor wide open race, um, who've come together uh, to record snippets that are then pulled together in a, a really, I think, lightweight, uh, thoughtful, well-produced video that's then uh, shareable online through GovFresh. Um, that, that's the impact right there that Luke has had in his own community. If you want to look further than that, um, you can actually find a mention of GovFresh in a link from the White House blog when Beth uh, Novak actually visited uh, Mainer for the Mainer Gov Fresh event. Uh, I think that's that's actually national recognition. Um, you know, Luke, Luke has made an impact uh, in terms of uh, I think influencing the conversations, in terms of being frank uh, with different parties. Uh, he's been I think quite refreshing in the new media space, um, which is ironic maybe for being Gov Fresh. Um, but he has uh, he's brought I think an important voice to the conversation, and it's one that people I think listen to. And uh, when I watch uh, that video, it's a reminder that um, when you create a space like this, it's actually offering uh, a different kind of platform uh, for uh, candidates, for politicians, for people in government to reach out to find one another in the same way they do on GovLoop or other places, uh, but also to be featured in a different way than uh, they might be elsewhere. I, I don't know that that's a piece or a frame that you would have seen in uh, local San Francisco media before Garfresh existed. Right. Uh, Luke, tell me, what was, out of all the candidates that you, you worked with there and listened to, what was the, who was the, the one that made a comment that stuck out most uh, to you? Um, well, I think that um, the, the one comment that stuck out the most was one of the candidates who is not so, so much tech-savvy um, he said, this process has made me think more about this. And to me, that's powerful, right? Um, you know, to begin to sort of educate candidates on what it means to be open and what open government is and what the principles are just in a, in a general level, but also specific open data, um, you know, open source, all, all of these issues around um, open government. And to be able to put that into their, um, into the psyche of the election, to me is, um, you know, is exciting. And when he said that to me, when we were talking afterwards, I just, you know, it just, it was a very rewarding comment that he that he made. 
Uh, you know what? Every time we can get uh, elected officials, uh, incumbents, or or those vying for a job like this to sit and think and talk about this, contemplate it, even at the highest levels if they haven't done it before. Luke, I agree with you 100%. It's absolutely valuable, and, and it's we need to have that that thing, that action happen more often. Certainly here at home in our own province of Alberta, we need to have it happen more, but we need to have it happen more around the world. So uh, I agree with you 1,000% on that. Um, let's move and shift quickly, uh, Alex, uh, with the – with uh, your segment, what we like to call Digifile, um, just simply because that uh, is also your Twitter name and it just uh, rings uh, nicely with uh, the segment that you present in terms of some of the stories you want to talk about. Now, there's a G8 summit happening over uh, overseas. Uh, mm -hmm. You wanted to highlight that a little bit. What did you think of President Sarkozy's uh, statements about uh, the Internet and so on? Well, it, uh, it's complex, shocking right this it, it's uh it's complicated um the on the one hand uh president sarkozy hailed the internet as an engine for economic development he uh hailed its uh role uh in, in uh revolutions um across the middle east uh talked about how it's allowed freedom of expression to flower about its ability to connect us uh really to you know, usher in a third uh, age of globalization uh, really to, to be this this driving force uh, for change and then balance that at the same time with uh, some of the concerns that uh, he has about uh, privacy, about protection of children online, uh, about uh, uh, most of all perhaps uh, intellectual property protection, which is something that uh, France has a, uh, well, again, a complicated history with. If you look at um, the policies under Sarkozy, he's uh, pushed uh, some of the most draconian uh, intellectual privacy uh, protections and and uh, and penalties um, anywhere. Uh, specifically, a three strikes law um, that the uh, one of the French courts ruled unconstitutional a couple of years ago, which essentially would uh, take away the access of somebody who was repeatedly uh, 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 warned not to share intellectual property online. Uh, and and many people feel that. Uh, given the importance of the Internet uh, in civil society and commerce and free speech and all the different things that uh, the Internet brings to us, uh, that's a disproportionate penalty. Um, I, th I think the, the complexity of it is, is that certainly uh, France, as with uh, the rest of the countries in the world, by and large, um, want to uh, tap into the economic benefits of the Internet. Um, they want to uh, be able to uh, bring that to their citizens. They certainly would love to be the home of the next Google uh, the next Facebook, whatever the, the next big thing happens to be, uh, the challenge is creating the conditions such that that can happen, um, whether it's a venture capital ecosystem, whether it's universities, uh, whether it's the, the right um, mix of um, privacy and patent protections, um, whether it's uh, the, the right mix of, um, uh, I think, uh, attitudes in, in terms of thinking through the relationships between citizens, government, and businesses. Um, this stuff's very hard to get right. Uh, I don't think anyone has gotten it quite right, in fact, least of all the United States. You know, we're, we're certainly working through um, at the local, state, and federal level what our policies are going to be. Um, one of the, the pieces of, of um, policy that came out, in fact, before the G8 came from the White House in its uh, international uh, strategy for cyberspace. And, and even in that terminology, you can see one of the challenges. Uh, cyberspace is not something that necessarily a lot of uh, citizens talk about anymore yeah. uh, you know maybe they talk about the internet or the web um, but uh, by and large um, th that's something that has blended together for, for many people particularly young people um, and I, I've written about that in the past on radar that, that that's an attitude and experience that uh, we don't we don't petition out and uh, Sarkozy spoke to that um, but I, I think that uh, there are many uh, people in the Internet community who have been here for a long time who uh, had some concerns about the way that he framed the issue. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I know that when I, uh, when I reviewed it and, uh, and, and had a look at what he was saying, um, yeah, I just, you know, one of the things that I, and you're right, it's very complex, but one of the things that struck my mind was, okay, we've got more, more regulation uh, via the G8 um, coming together potentially down the road where larger businesses will have an advantage on the lobbying side. It, it's just going to be, you know, that was my sort of simplistic take on it. But, you know, you're right. As absolutely, it, uh, it is a very complex issue. 
And uh, it's going to affect any down the road. I think anything that does come out of this may, will definitely affect business on a, on a whole lot of levels, even if the Internet itself is not your primary method of earning a living. Um, it's definitely going to impact uh, life uh, in general coming down the road, I think, anyways. So okay. let's move on to your second story here today as part of the Digifile. Uh, we're heading to WashingtonPost.com. Looks like a blog post to me, uh, Post Politics. Uh, open government sites scrapped due to budget cuts by Ed O'Keefe. Uh, what did you want to highlight there? Well, I, I could also send you to the Sunlight Foundation, um, the Daniel, Shul, uh, Daniel Schumann, um, who is uh, the director of the Transparency Caucus. Uh, he's also um, one of their uh, really just top-notch uh, writers. Uh, he's uh, used to work for the Congressional Research Service, and he's been tracking this issue around uh, what uh, Sunlight Foundation has called Save the Data, which is essentially as soon as the, um, the last budget came through, it was clear that uh, funding had been cut for uh, open government data sites at the federal level. Um, we went from $34 million down to $2 million. Eventually, some of that funding was restored to $8 million. Um, and since then, everybody has been uh, wondering, you know, what, what was going to happen because uh, clearly there wasn't enough money to go around. So now we know. Um, it looks like they're going to uh, put Fed space on hiatus. Uh, there's a citizen engagement dashboard at the GSA that they're also going to knock down so those two things. And then um, data.gov and the IT dashboard are going to stay up, but it looks like, uh, at least judging from what we've been able to see so far, and this has received a fair amount of coverage, which perhaps deserves its own comment, um, at the Washington Post, at Tech President, uh, certainly uh, other, other sites including Information Week, uh, you know, the tech, government tech press, um, the fact that it got into the Washington Post and the Washington Post tweeted it um, meant there's a much more awareness of the fact that these sites are going uh, being taken down or weren't going to go up in the case of FedSpace since it was in beta. So um, we talk about, uh, Alex, I've, I've got a quick question. It says in the post there that, that the cuts come after budget negotiators last month mm -hmm. slashed. Now, let's talk about the, the, you know, the unnamed, as of unnamed, budget negotiators. Who do you think that is behind the scenes leading the charge and cutting this precise part of the budget? Well, we don't know who made the initial cut, um, but we absolutely know who uh, was negotiating because they are, they're quite clear about it. If you look back, back through the coverage, you can see, you know, the, the head of the House Appropriations Committee is the person to look at there. And, and that was um, the, the person that uh, the different advocates, um, the people from the Sunlight Foundation, et cetera, uh, were talking to. Um, and I can go, I, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm a little bit blurred from my, my um, trip, so I can't tell you, quote you exactly who the representative is, but if you Google um, the uh, chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, you'll find that right away. That, that's, that's the key person here. And um, there are the, the rest of the um, people who are on, the, uh, on, on that committee are, are the ones to look at in this case, along with, with other uh, representatives, because they all have some amount of say in terms of, of being uh, part of the conversation. Um, there was a commitment made by uh, Congressman Daryl Issa from California um, that funding would be preserved, but it came with a caveat. Um, he's a very uh, technical... Uh, technologically advanced person to be in Congress in terms of being an entrepreneur, in terms of using the tools himself and understanding them, and has talked quite a bit about the importance of open data. But um, I think he has also internalized a lot of the critiques of data.gov and these other sites in terms of data quality um, and would like to see them become uh, much more functional and have the data quality be much higher um, and to see those improvements. And has talked about actually allocating a lot more money if that could happen. Uh, but he made a pledge to, to preserve a certain amount of that and, and certainly was a, a participant in, in that. So uh, it was an important move in terms of look, seeing that um, the open government data conversation reached across the aisle. You know uh, what? I, just, I would agree with the quality of the, the, the data in the sense of that being an important point. I mean, obviously, we want clean, relevant data that's, uh, you know, to, to, to work with. We don't want to be working with with uh, data that's not accurate. Obviously, that's important. Um, having that being something that hinges on, you know, a budget and funding, well, I, you know, I suppose that's one way to take it. I, I, how do you think that the, uh, this will impact um, so the, the movement, the space, as you, if you will, the, the, the movers and shakers, obviously with some of this uh, money being taken out, projects being canceled, how will that will affect, uh, you know, the, the space itself? And when do you think, if at all, some of this budget uh, levels will return in terms of the funding down the road? 
Well, when we're talking about the space, I think you have to define it as a lot more than the federal government. Absolutely, uh, the, the, sure. You know, uh, the, you know, you're you're in Canada. Luke's out in California. Um, you know, I've got people popping up in my feed from from England, from Australia. Um, this has uh, gone much further, I think, than a conversation in Washington. And, and while I report from here, I live here, uh, it, it's it's largely inevitable that I'm going to be, um, you know, somewhat more focused on what's happening here sometimes than, than what's happening elsewhere. Uh, to my detriment, I'm, I'm working on uh, being as aware as I can uh, more so of what's happening elsewhere. You know, open data does not rest alone with uh, the United States federal government. And more to the point, it doesn't rest simply with the site being up itself. I mean, the, the, the thing that's important to think about in, these con in this context is to the extent that um, data exists um, in a distributed fashion elsewhere. Data.gov uh, aggregated links to the data, but often it actually resided somewhere else. Right. The, um, the, the, I think the important thing to look at in this case might be um, to what extent do these cuts affect uh, Health and Human Services, HHS, releasing its data? Um, that's probably the, the best open data story in government right now. They're going to have a, a, a very important event um, here in, in D.C. in Health IT Week, the second week of June. Uh, they're going to unveil dozens of new apps and services based on their data. Um, I would expect uh, that it's not going to affect that. Um, and uh, to, to the extent w that um, we're seeing uh, posts go up, I shared one of them yesterday from Dan Kaysen at Microsoft, uh, or, or uh, commentators talk about a tipping point for Gov2.0, open government in crisis, or the death of open government, something that next Gov ran, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's, it's really pushing uh, credulity, right? I mean, yeah. to, be, to use a very strong term here, it's not reasonable to say, because these sites are around, um, uh, that... Uh, this is somehow uh, changing what's happening in a much larger sense. You know, transparency has gone global. Open data is a worldwide phenomenon. We've seen more than 16 other sites pop up. Uh, data.gov is a symbolic thing, right? It is, it is significant that it stays up. It is significant that the U.S. is, is uh, perhaps not going to put as many resources into it, that the CIO has said we can't allocate development resources to it. It's certainly interesting in the context of the news that Socrata, which is the open data um, uh, cloud uh, uh, provider out of um, Seattle, is going to be part of the new data.gov. It'll be interesting to see what functionality um, exists or is added on despite budget cuts because they'll be able to do it cheaper through that platform. Um, but the, uh, the reality here is, is that um, a lot of the data already existed elsewhere. A lot of it will still be available online. Um, for the, the, all the different constituencies at the state and local level, this does not change it for them or yeah. for the different countries. So yeah, it is a bigger issue. You're absolutely it's just correct. A federal, it's a couple of federal sites. Yeah. Okay. Uh, guys, listen, we, uh, we're wrapping up here. It's been fantastic talking with you today. Uh, I think we've, we've covered off some great points. Uh, Luke Fretwell from uh, Lafayette, California, uh, GovFresh.com, founder of GovFresh.com. Thank you for joining us today, Luke. Thank you for having me, Walter. Uh, Alex, again, always a pleasure. Thank you again for being on the show today. Um, you know, it's been great uh, speaking with, uh, with you on, on the different subjects that you brought up today as well. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, certainly, uh, this may be the, the last time before I get married. We'll see what happens, uh, whether we can make this happen next week or not. Uh, after that, I'm going to be out of pocket for June. Okay, well, fantastic. Listen, congratulations on that uh, that happy note. Uh, have a wonderful wedding, and we'll talk to you on the flip side of that wonderful event. Uh, by the way, you mentioned next week. Next week, we have a special, another special guest on the show. We have Bill Schreier, who's the CIO for the City of Seattle. He'll be on the show next week here at Gov2 on FuseLogic TV. Until next week, do yourself a favor. Tell everybody about open government in your local region. And hopefully you'll come back and tune in to us uh, next week, Thursday at 1.30 Mountain Standard here at FuseLogic.tv. Take care. We'll see you next week.